Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you much, so much for joining us uh, for this webinar on hybrid green infrastructure as a part of the Learning from Connected Communities, an in-depth look at nature-based climate solutions in Atlantic Canada webinar series. Uh, this series is uh, led by us here at the New Brunswick Environmental Network. Um, my name is Lily Bearflow, and I'm a project coordinator working on nature-based climate solutions. And we are partnered with Climate Atlantic as well as um, for this webinar series. So, bienvenue to the monde uh, cette webinar aujourd'hui. Welcome to you all to this series webinar, this webinar today on uh, hybrid infrastructure. It's part of the series of uh, webinars uh, learning from connected communities and in depth look at nature based climate solutions in Atlanta. This series of webinars is led by us uh, at the New Brunswick Environmental Network with the support of Nature and Bee and Clean Atlantic. My name is Lily Baraclau and I'm coordinate the project uh, at the Environmental Network here. Uh, on This is a series on nature-based solutions. We have simultaneous interpretation available today. Uh, both presentations will be primarily in English. Um, and so if you would like to listen to all of the speech today in French, uh, you can find the globe button um, on the bottom right of your um, screen and you can select the language that you would like to hear today's event in. Uh, si vous voulez écouter if you would like to listen to this event in French, uh, click on the interpretation the below on the left, on the right rather, and select uh, 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 French if you want to hear it in French. Welcome to pose questions in the language of your choice. But please do remember when you are on a um, an interpretation channel, you need to speak the language of that channel. So, si vous êtes sur le so if you're on interpretation in French, if you want to speak in French, when you're asking questions. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. But here at the New Brunswick Environmental Network, we do work across the of the Mi'kmaq, Wampiskwe, and Passamaquoddy peoples. And it's incredibly important when we're talking about adapting and mitigating climate change that we acknowledge that <clears throat> decolonization must play a role in efforts to respond to the climate crisis. And, and that many of the techniques and uh, knowledge that we apply in working on nature-based climate solutions um, does draw on the traditional knowledge of the indigenous peoples of this land. As I mentioned, this webinar series is led by us here at the New Brunswick Environmental Network. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what we do here at the NBAN, we are a communication network um, that links over 110 environmental nonprofits in New Brunswick, and we were established in 1991. And we also have a long based climate solutions and climate adaptation, <clears throat> as we previously hosted a, an effort through the Building Regional Adaptation Capacity and Expertise Project um, with planners and engineers in New Brunswick. And uh, now our current project is under Infrastructure Canada, uh, looking at supporting municipalities to build nature-based climate solutions. <clears throat> this webinar is one in a series of webinars looking at different types of nature-based climate solutions across Atlantic Canada. Uh, this is our fourth webinar in the series. You can find the recordings of our earlier webinars on the New Brunswick Environmental Network YouTube. And we have upcoming webinars as well, one on July 4th on shorelines, um, one on July 20th on naturalized stormwater retention ponds, and it, hopefully uh, some other time in July or August um, focus on conserving nature to respond to climate change. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn to our our wonderful speakers for today. Um, and first, I would like to introduce Amanda Marlin, who will be speaking to us first. 
Amanda um, was is originally from Quebec's Eastern Townships and has a degree in geography from Mount Allison University and a master's in environmental studies from Dalhousie University. Since 2013, Amanda has been executive director at EOS Eco Energy, an award-winning environmental charity. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda and um, look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let me just get this going. All right. Uh, okay, so I've been asked to talk about our green roof projects, which we did three summers ago now uh, here in Sackville. So if you're not uh, too familiar with EOS Eco Energy, I'll give you a little bit of our background to begin with and then go into what natural infrastructure is, um, as well as what a green roof is, and then go over the many benefits of these kinds of projects and green roof. Uh, and then um, explore the projects that we did here in Sackville in a bit more detail, go over how we're using green roofs, and then the lessons learned uh, is how I'll wrap up. So EOS has uh, been around for 20 years, actually. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. We're an environmental charity, as Lily mentioned. Uh, and we sort of focus on the Chignecto region of New Brunswick, so the southeast corner of the province. Um, and we really focus on climate change mitigation and adaptation, so both of those, and at the community local level. So research, we do a fair amount of community planning with our municipalities, a lot of education and outreach, um, and lots of action projects on the ground or on the rooftop, as we'll talk about today. Um, and so to do all the things we do, uh, it's definitely always a collaborative or so that sort of connected community theme is always part of what EOS does. Uh, and so we're collaborating with lots of different people, businesses, levels of government in our region as well to make these things happen. Um, so what is natural infrastructure? A green roof is an example, for sure, of natural infrastructure. We have some of our other projects focused uh, are featured here as well. So things like our green roofs, our food forests are also examples of natural infrastructure. Um, it's really an active space created by humans for a particular purpose. Um, so in the case of the green roof, our, um, our main purpose is sort of stormwater uh, runoff reduction, flood risk reduction. Lots of other reasons why you might choose natural infrastructure. Um, and there's lots of benefits to these kinds of projects. So they can be less costly than traditional kinds of infrastructure projects, but a really big benefit to them is that their value increases over time. They get better over time. So right now we're looking at the third spring and summer for our green roofs and they're really filling in and doing better, um, providing more value. Um, but natural infrastructure projects can also flood risk, they can um, reduce urban heat island effect, and they also have lots of other benefits too. So they can increase biodiversity, provide habitat. They're also spaces to grow food, and I'll explain how we're doing that on the green roofs. Natural infrastructure projects. Another reason why we really like them at EOS is because they address... You get... Um, you get a double whammy of benefit from natural infrastructure projects. Uh, and then EOS really likes a community-based approach. So as I said, we're really focusing on what we can do at the community level. What can we do with our local partners? How can we help each other adapt, whether it's homeowners, schools, our municipalities? Um, we're really looking at what we can do here locally. And so we've experienced stormy weather, flooding, um, food insecurity issues, supply well. So we're always looking at what we can do here locally. And so um, there's lots of benefits from doing these community-based natural infrastructure projects, such as the green roof. It's great to create more outdoor community spaces. We've pandemic um, and just so nice for our mental health to be outside more. Spaces to grow food, to connect with nature, to work together to do all of these things as well, really builds our skills and empowers our communities to be more resilient. So then I want to get into what exactly a green roof is. If you're not familiar or haven't seen one, um, here's a nice aerial shot of the green roof here on the town hall in Sackville, New Brunswick. Um, there are a couple of different green roofs, so intensive and extensive. So an intensive green roof means the soil is deeper 
uh, so deep that it can actually grow trees up on the rooftops. Uh, we see some examples of this in places like Halifax and in Ontario, Toronto and stuff. These are more expensive um, to put in to maintain for sure. So with our budget for, for our projects, we did extensive roofs, so shallower soil. So our projects are between like six and eight inches of soil depth. So they're lighter, less expensive to put in, easier to and but it means we're only growing grasses, flowers, herbs, the things that you'll see in our pictures here. Um, lots of benefits to both kinds of green roofs, though, for sure. Um, and we're seeing these here already. So, as I mentioned, a great way to help reduce flood risk. So reduce the runoff coming off of our buildings because the plants are going to absorb some of that water and the special soil helps absorb it and hold it. It, they can filter pollutants. They add an insulative layer to the building. As you'll see in my next slides, all the different layers that um, make up a green roof in the soil as well. Um, they help to increase biodiversity. They create that habitat. We immediately see bees and butterflies and birds up there on the roof. Um, they really do uh, help reduce our stress and connect us to nature. Being on the green roof is always a special space to be. Um, and we are growing food as well, which definitely helps to, um, to improve our resiliency to climate change. Um, so here are our projects specifically from a few summers ago. We had funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, they really wanted us to focus on ways to reduce runoff with natural infrastructure. We're always trying to find some new and different things that EOS hasn't done before, and green roofs um, was something that we wanted to try out. So they also wanted us to promote the benefits of this kind of a project to the public, so we were looking for public spaces. So the roof of the town hall that's featured in the picture here was really ideal. Um, and then again, getting at the community resilience aspect. Um, so here's the project, uh, or both projects. There's a picture of the green roof on the town hall and the green roof at Mount A. So we had really great partnerships with both of these organizations. Um, and then we had to follow some specific steps. So we needed to start with engineering load checks for each building. Now, we were lucky because these buildings were built or renovated in the case of the building on campus for green roofs. So their inverted roofs are built specifically to hold a green roof, but we wanted to still make sure everything was safe and could hold the weight of so much soil. And especially when it gets wet and ab absorbing that moisture. Um, we then needed to order materials and plants. Nobody manufactures green roof um, supplies here in the maritime. So we were ordering things in from Quebec. Um, we had to figure out what plants might work. We talked to a lot of experts, did some research. Um, and then the roofs were installed by qualified contractors, different contractors in each case, and there are certainly qualified folks around the Maritimes. Uh, and then we were able to do the planting, so EOS staff and volunteers, community members, um, and students on campus and staff planted there. Um, the Town Hall Green Roof, um, as I said, it was designed originally for a green roof. Part of the space over a decade ago did have a green roof installed on it, but with our funding we were able to extend it to the whole area where it was meant to be, and we were also able to revive that original green roof from over a decade ago. But in that uh, original spot, you can see a lot of the tall tufts of grass. Those are more than a decade old. They've been growing really well. We added to it. Uh, these are some pictures of the construction phase of the green roof on Town Hall. Uh, so you can see we needed, a, or the installers, the contractors needed a, a boom crane to get everything carefully up onto the roof. And then it's a matter of laying out the layers, really, um, and taping them down so that you get a waterproof barrier. So you start with that waterproof layer, then a root barrier. There's a drainage layer, which kind of looks like upside down bubble wrap, really. Um, there's a filter cloth layer and then the growing medium, which is especially engineered soil. So it's quite um, sort of spongy. It can just it can absorb and hold more uh, more water than if you were just going to go dump a bag, bunch of bags of regular garden soil up there. Um, and then we finish with our plants, of course. So here's what we planted. Um, as I said, we this was new to us. So we were doing research as we were going and trying to talk with lots of experts. And I got quite a bit of conflicting advice, which made it tricky between green roof experts that are in Ontario and Quebec. And of course they have a different climate out there. 
versus um, green roof resources here in the Maritimes. There, is an, there has been an experimental green roof on campus at St. Mary's for many years. So I reached out to those guys as well and ended up kind of trying a little bit of everything to see what would work. Gardening always seems to be an experiment, whether it's on the ground or on a roof anyway. Um, we also had to contend with some areas that are quite shady on the roof, because you can see at the back of the picture there, um, the, well, that's actually the wall of the fire department that's next to town hall. So that created some shade for a good part of the day in that section of the roof. Um, and then we needed plants that could be flexible. So that could withstand dry conditions, but also be inundated and be very wet at two. Because our soil up there couldn't be too deep, it's like seven inches or so, we couldn't grow anything that's too tall either because we don't want it to tip over. So some of the things we chose, um, native strawberries, they're doing really well. A variety of grasses, um, different wildflowers, mint and oregano and other herbs that are good on the green roof. Um, and then we can do more things last year too. We also installed some solar lighting and some signage. So here's the green roof at night, a really nice space even uh, after the sun goes down. And it has always been promoted as a, a public rooftop park. And so in Sackville, if you're driving through or if you live here, be sure to uh, to visit the green roof. Anytime town hall is open regular business hours, you are more than welcome to go up and have lunch or have a snack or hang out or have a meeting up there. It, it really is considered a park. Now, unfortunately, we did these projects um, during the height of COVID. And so that first summer meant we couldn't have any group tours and it was a bit hard to really promote it well. Um, but it continues to be maintained by the town, um, weeded and watered and all those good things. And people are starting to find their way up there more and more. So I also wanted to show you a bit of a, a video tour since we can't be up there in person today. This was shortly after we planted it. So now, as I said, this is we're going to our third summer. The plants have really filled in, taken very well. Even that old soil that's more than a decade old, still lots of goodness in there and, and things are growing really well. Uh, you can see those original big tufts of grass and the additional things we've planted. So the lavender and the yarrow and the sedums and, um, the, and all the strawberries are uh, really expanding well. And they the strawberries are great. Like they're like the size of your thumb. It's so yummy too up there. We tried to grow some blueberries to see what would happen. The soil, of course, is not really all that acidic. So we have picked some blueberries, but they're not taking off. Um, lots of lilies and different things and black-eyed Susans you can see there as well. So I also wanted to show you a couple of pictures of the Mount A green roof. So we did have funding to help with a couple of different green roof projects that year. So at, on campus here at Mount A, it's on the student center roof, um, a decent sized area that we were able to turn into green roof. They uh, decided to install a leak detection system under their roof. So they paid a bit of extra for that above and beyond what we were able to do. They also had certified roofers install their building. Everything needed to um, you know, work well with their warranty and not void all that sort of stuff. Um, so all of that was followed carefully on campus too. Um, and then it was planted by Mountie professors and students and volunteers um, that following spring. Uh, so last year, which was year two for the project, we were able to do a few more things in between COVID waves in Sackville. And so we did give some public green roof tours. We had girl guides up there to do some fun activities. We had the seniors college class come and get a, a tour and a lesson about the green roof. Last summer, we planted a bunch of vegetables, which is what you see in the um, pictures here, and we donated them to our local food bank. We're actually doing that again this year because the food bank was so um, pleased and excited to get fresh vegetables and grown on the rooftop right here in town. So we're doing more of that this year also. Um, the green roof has also been visited by other municipalities and, and other government departments. It's one of the few, um, maybe the only one of the few uh, green roofs in New York. So we really wanted to help kind of um, uh, share knowledge and, and, uh, and expose New Brunswickers to green roofs as well. So nice to see that it did get noticed by other municipalities. On campus, their space uh, is going to be a student space. It's a class space, a learning um, and hands-on space for students as well. 
So we learned a lot for sure. As I said, this was new to us when we started. So we learned very quickly that there are not very many green roofs in New Brunswick yet. Uh, so it was a bit hard to find some local expertise. But one of the main things, if you are interested in doing this and if you have a suitable roof, because that's the thing, it's that not all roofs are suitable. You can't just slap a bunch of dirt and plants on any roof. Um, helpful, you need those inverted roofs you need buildings really that were kind of set up for it or or renovated for it um so you sure start with those engineering checks you want to make sure that it, the building can handle the load um there are uh, a lack of manufacturers of green roof materials and supplies in the maritimes but there are certainly options for installers so it's just a matter of making sure you consider the timeline for delivery um, because that delayed us, but it also delayed us because of COVID and everything was everything was delayed and shipments of all sorts were delayed that summer. Um, we also had some challenges. As I mentioned, we had some conflicting advice and that might have been to do with just different kinds of climates and stuff. Um, I mean, as one example, we had green roof experts in Ontario say we should plant yellow lilies and then local, more local folks saying, I don't think you should put lilies on the roof. And anyway, we tried, as I said, a little bit of everything and the lilies are doing all right. Um, we estimated originally and we were told that the cost for an extensive green roof or more shallow green roof would be between 20 and 25,000 or 20 and 25 dollars a square foot. Uh, and that is about what it came out to be. We certainly were able to save some cost because we did it ourselves and we used, you know, community volunteers. But if you're trying to figure out whether you could afford it or you're looking at a project, you can kind of budget for it in there. Um, there were some plants that didn't survive that first winter, but they were planted along that shady section there um, where there was also quite a bit of snow pile up. Now, last year we went back and we had more shade tolerant things like hostas and astilbe, which are not um, native species. We were really trying to focus on a lot of native things. Uh, but for that kind of situation, we went with things that would be much hardier in the shade. And I was just up on the roof today, actually, for a meeting and that all of those things are doing really well. Um, so you just try other things as you go. We've harvested lots of strawberries, um, some blueberries, lots of herbs as well, and all those vegetables that we planted. If you're thinking about doing a project like this and, and many of the natural infrastructure projects, whether you're thinking of green roofs or food forests or the rain gardens, it's a question of maintenance down the road because unfortunately we can get funding for these kinds of projects from federal provincial funders, but it's really hard to get that ongoing maintenance funding. And so that has been a challenge with all of our projects. And so we always look for really good partners. And so the town of Sackville is continuing to cover the cost of um, having folks come in and weed or installing a bit of a sprinkler system, just making sure everything is still okay over the years. Same on campus, it's students and staff continuing to maintain the green roof there. Um, and we really learned throughout the pandemic, for sure, that we need more outdoor spaces in town, um, more outdoor spaces. And so green roofs and other natural infrastructure projects are great examples of uh, a multi-purpose, multi-use spaces. So I want to say thank you, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions or hear any comments um, or suggestions. The last picture that I've included here was just from our recent AGM for EOS. We held it on the green roof. After three years of Zoom AGMs, we got together in person and went no tech at all, and also enjoyed a mocktail that one of our local restaurants concocted for us with ingredients from the green roof. They made us a lovely mint uh, iced tea with sage bitters. I don't know how you make that from the sage on the roof and then a floral syrup and there was uh, yarrow and chive ice. So anyway, really nice that, that she made us a little mocktail there and uh, lots of yummy things. So we're looking forward to growing more on the roof, as I said, and also donating to the food bank. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, for the wonderful presentation. We will move to the question period at the end of both presentations, but please, if you have questions uh, for Amanda, you can put them in the chat and we'll, we'll bring them up um, after our second presentation. So uh, next, I would like to introduce Kelly Emma, who coordinates the Green Shores program on the East Coast. Uh, their job as education and outreach coordinator is to promote the use of nature-based solutions to climate change. So I will turn it over to Kelly and uh, yeah, look forward to hearing your presentation as 
All right, thank you so much, Lily. Um, like she said, my name is Kelly Umla. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Transcoastal Adaptation. I'm coming to you from Pacific Cook in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, McMonkey, and I work for Transcoastal Adaptation Center for Nature-Based Solutions at St. Mary's University. And I am the point of contact for the Green Shores Program on the East Coast. So if you're not familiar with the Green Shores Program, um, it is a program that started in 2005 um, by the Center or the Stewardship Center for BC. Um, the initiative it promotes healthy shore environments that provide significant environmental, economic, and social values to both coastal and lakeside communities. Um, this program provides options and tools for a wide range of planning, design, and construction professionals, as well as landowners interested in minimizing their environmental impact um, cost effectively. So all in all, this is an initiative that provides science-based tools and best practices to help our folks minimize the impact of new development and restore shoreline ecosystem function of previously developed sites. So Green Shores, it's that there are two different programs um, within the Green Shores program. Um, it's a rigorous standard, um, and these four guiding principles here are to preserve and restore shoreline physical processes, so the processes that are happening either on a coastal or uh, lake front uh, shoreline, to maintain that function and diversity along the shoreline, to prevent or reduce pollutants, entering the aquatic environment, or to avoid or reduce cumulative impacts, which are all of these impacts combined, creating more intense impacts. So these programs, um, there's two, like I mentioned, the first is the Green Shores for Homes program, um, and that is for homeowners and landowners, anyone living on a shoreline, um, smaller scale projects. And then we also have the Green Shores for Shoreline Development Program, um, which is a large scale that's yeah. either both public municipal projects or private development on their shorelines. And so this program provides credit, a credit and rating system um, that helps uh, homeowners and developers to develop their shoreline in a store friendly way. Like I mentioned, the programs are science-based. Um, we're promoting shoreline project design that dissipates wave energy, accommodates for storm surges and lessens flooding. Um, these are generally the main issues that people living on the shorelines are experiencing. We also incentivize habitat restoration and the creation of natural areas while protecting coastal ecology and sediment transport processes. Um, and so, not only are we restoring the, or we're protecting this shoreline, but we're also uh, creating these natural areas and sort of re-naturalizing or just uh, revitalizing the shoreline um, back to its more natural glory. And it offers resilient approaches to things like sea level rise and climate change adaptation, which is part of what we are here to learn about in these webinars. Green Stars is a very validated program. It's consistently funded both nationally and internationally. Um, we mainly work in Canada, but we do have um, a lot of support from Washington and um, along the Pacific Seaboard of the United States. We've, it's won many awards, such as uh, the Best Environmental Idea to Address Sea Level Rise in 2014. And it has gone through many scientific reviews by multiple technical committees. Um, these are experts in their field from academia, the government, private and industry, non-governmental organizations, and more. Um, as you can see, the two iterations of the Green Shores for Homes Guide um, on the right-hand side there um, has gone through uh, all of these different organizations to ensure that it has the greatest scientific value and is the most uh, correct and the most rigorous um, practices and amount of knowledge for, for homeowners. And so as you may have 
been aware, there is sort of a hierarchy or a, a, a spectrum of different solutions that we can do to protect the shorelines. The first being that natural shoreline. So whenever we see a natural shoreline um, that has not been disturbed or interacted with by humans, essentially, especially um, through colonization, um, that is that more natural shoreline. We want to leave the and that will uh, make sure that the shoreline is best protected in its original state. We also have soft shoreline treatments. And these sorts of treatments are um, emulate natural systems. Um, and they effectively maintain um, the aesthetic, recreational, and ecological values. So these um, treatments use the sediments and um, uh, what are they called? The nourishment and the uh, protection measures that are native to the area and native to that shoreline in particular. And then what we're focusing on for this presentation is the hybrid shoreline treatment. So these are those that uh, mix both soft and hard shoreline treatment um, to make its entirely new thing shoreline treatment. So they use harder harder substances like rock or gravel um, and in addition to the softer things like sand um, or small cobbles. And a lot of the harder portions can be buried below the surface um, to maintain more natural look. Um, and we're really, when it comes to shores, trying to minimize the amount of hardened um, shorelines as best as possible. So hybrid shorelines are essentially the, the lowest on the gray, gray to green scale that we're going for. Um, and that's um, the best ones that fit into the green shores framework. So some examples of some shorelines, most of these are in Nova Scotia. Um, one of them is in PEI, so very um, local context here. So examples of natural shorelines are on the top. The first one is near Antigonish, and there is no disturbance from humans there. It's a natural shoreline. It's growing the way that it should. Um, as well as on the side there, that is down near Prospect Bay. In the middle, we have soft shoreline treatments. Um, so the big one on the left is a uh, bank vegetation, structural logs, and regrading of the bank in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Um, that is a living shoreline approach, as well as the one next to it, which is from Helping Nature Heal, um, which is also a living shoreline. So essentially using um, plants, logs, bales, and regrading of banks um, to hold the soil together to reduce erosion and to dissipate wave energy. Now for hybrid shoreline treatment, we've had a couple examples. The first one on the left is in Mahone Bay. Um, if anyone's familiar, it is a constructed salt marsh. Um, it has a bank at the back and has rock sill or breakwaters um, on the All of this is constructed and it was added and it's considered a hybrid shoreline treatment due to the vegetation in combination with the rock and breakwater. On the other side, we have reef balls. Um, those were from the Clean Foundation, also in 2021, and they're submerged below the high water mark um, to allow corals to grow first on those, as well as to dissipate some wave energy there. So the benefits of the Green Shores program, um, this here is an example of a Green Shores for Homes project that was in, that implemented a hybrid solution in British Columbia. Uh, the low bank beach is gently sloped um, with cobble and boulder sized material and is subject to dynamic erosion from both high tide and storm events. Um, erosion is also impacted by the large um, fetch, which is the distance across water that uh, wind has to go uninterrupted by things like land or trees. Um, off the Strait of Georgia and uh, from both consistent prevailing winds 
as well as that large bench. The upper shore was being undercut by erosion. Along the natural boundary, they placed a buried revetment um, by placing large boulders within a dug trench over which they capped with sand and gravel and some cobble um, to, mimic, to mimic a coastal dune and to create plantable spots on the, on the shoreline. Um, a one meter wide strip of shoreline shrubs was planted at the top of the slope using a native species of dune grass, uh, entire leaved gumweed, beach pea, and seashore lupine. In the back shore area, they planted Saskatoon berries, snowberry, and dune grass as well. And under the Green Shores framework, um, using the credits and ratings guide, this project received 21 points um, for a Green Shores rating of level one, which today is the equivalent of a silver rating, which is very good. It worked. Um, it was evaluated by SNC Lavalin in 2014 both the District of West Vancouver and the Town of Qualicum Beach provided uh, case scenarios and there was funding funding or the Natural Research Canada or something like that, I believe. And um, they completed conceptual hard and soft protection designs and cost evaluation for these three case examples. Um, they all accounted for one meter of sea level rise in each design. And they developed and used the evaluation framework to assess ecological value of soft versus hard shoreline. The result um, for the green shores uh, evaluation of sea level rise, uh, the alternatives provided neutral to enhanced ecological resilience, while the hard armor example led to neutral to reduced ecological resiliency. While I'm not sell so, few walls or anything like that, we should acknowledge that there are places and methods of achieving, achieving positive things with hard alternatives, and that's where hybrid solutions can also come into play. Um, oftentimes, these hard solutions are required for certain amounts of, of wave energy. So costing evaluation. Um, in general, the green shores alternatives are anywhere between 30 to 70% less expensive to both design and construct in these space examples. As you can see, these numbers are from those examples in BC, so this is Canadian dollars. Um, however, this was in 2014, so odd, odds are that some inflation has happened since. But in general, the sea walls, um, hard alternatives are much, um, whereas the soft alternative a little bit cheaper um, and especially more accessible for homeowners specifically. And in general, um, we have different types here. We have the non-structural, so things like very soft, um, soft protection measures like planting or regrading and filling. And those can range anywhere from 45 to 225. The hybrid in the middle there, um, a little bit more expensive, but still pretty achievable. We have 250 to $400, um, pretty good there. And then others, hardware examples, anywhere between 500 and almost $2,000. And these examples are in the state. Um, so could be even a bit, a bit more than if it was Canadian dollars. So in general, the, the benefits to costs um, of the Green Shores program, there are $7 worth of benefits for every $1 cost and that cultural and economic factors and co-benefits of a green shoreline. Um, by using Green Shores, we can demonstrate the benefits because we have verified projects and are using trained professionals and we also support at the local government level um, to add value to them and add built capacity. So for anyone interested in applying or in implementing a Green Shores project, we have three different stages here. The first is to enroll and initiate, initiate either on the Transcoastal Adaptations website or through the Stewardship Center of BC. Then you would start your project design and construction. We have a list of credits here that uh, 
a home, Green Shores for Homes project would apply for. And stage three would be to verify and receive your reward or award. Um, so like I said, you'd submit your application. There would be a verifier to make sure that um, you've actually fulfilled the credits um, requirements. And then you would get your rating depending on which credits you achieved. If you'd like to know more about the Green Shores program, um, we have training sessions we offer from through Transcoast Adaptations and St. Mary's University. Um, but we are also able to travel throughout the Maritimes and offer them in communities. Um, so level one is definitely recommended for anyone interested in implementing Green Shores. Um, it's just an introduction. Then level two is application-based, actually going out to sites and trying to implement them. And then in level three are for professionals who would like to be on a list on showing, on um, providing support to actually implement Green Shores projects. So I wanna thank you all for listening. Um, my information bottom here, if you're interested in reaching out, um, you can reach out to my personal email, kelly.umla at cmu.ca, or you can reach out to our transcoastal adaptations at cmu.ca. Um, email as well, and I'm from my coworkers. So if you have any questions at all um, that can't be answered during this webinar, please reach out via email, and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, for a really informative presentation. Uh, so we will now move into our question period and take questions for both speakers. Um, and you're welcome to pose the questions in the chat in either language, or if you want to raise your as well. Donc, en bas, and avoir les questions maintenant. So we'll have our questions now for the speakers. So if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat or raise your virtual hand and you can ask the question. There's one question in the chat. The, the raised hands. Um, is the same, um, or are they the same? Are there similar resources that exist for riparian buffers on rivers as they're due for green shores? That's a great question. We don't have one currently, but a lot of similar um, issues that are faced along river shorelines can be faced um, on uh, lake shorelines as well. So, um, although we don't have a specific um, program for um, Repairing areas on on uh, river fronts, we do um, suggest looking at the framework for lakeshore and and sort of extrapolating from that. And a and a professional can help um, anyone interested in in repairing uh, protection on river fronts. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to Janelle. That's her hand raised. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for putting this on, Lily. And uh, this is a. Um, a comment slash question, both actually for Amanda and and uh, Kelly, um, because I think I, I keep hearing this from um, various sources, and so I I'm, I want to say it out loud. If there's any gardeners, uh, greenhouse aficionados, gardeners, that it really seems times for people to grow grow things that will go on the green roof. And also uh, to source the other other materials like uh, like the special soil, Amanda, you were talking about, and all those layers. So I, you know, I just want to put it out there, like tell your friends that this is, the, and there's going to be a bigger and bigger need, I think, for this type of thing too. But I don't know, uh, Amanda, and then Kelly, if you do you want to comment on that, like what you're your what you're seeing the need for, that would be cool. Yeah, no, I agree, Janelle, for sure. Um, we do our best to find things as locally as we can and um, and native varieties or sometimes we have to, you know, be sort of as native adjacent as we can or sometimes you have to be careful too, like Cornhill Nursery that we use a lot sometimes and it's been a few years where they would send us substitutions. So I'd always say like, no substitutions, it's either this or nothing um, and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, um, and there's lots of, of really nice but rare 
um, indigenous plants around here that I would love to be able to use and you just can't find a commercial source for them and you shouldn't really go digging up whatever from your backyard. Um, so yeah, no, it would be lovely to see more local sources and and for sure um, the local materials for the green roof and and because also as some of the green roofs get to be older and to be able to um, yeah replenish some of that soil and stuff like that. So yep, totally agree. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, like Molly gratefully put in the chat, um, there is a nursery for um, coastal plants um, called Rising Tide Nursery that um, through my good friend Kirsten Ellis um, from CB West, uh, CB Wetlands and Environmental Specialists. They do a lot of uh, salt marsh restoration and um, protection. So they require a lot of those very highly specialized plants. Um, and so Kristen has taken it upon herself and as well as uh, through CB West to um, grow those plants on their own. Um, so that's in the, I think the South Shore area of Nova Scotia. Um, so if anyone is doing any coastal restoration, um, specifically looking for salt marsh plants, there are some there. Um, and there's definitely, uh, I believe that's the only one around the Maritimes um, that does specifically coastal plants. There might be some, there might be one in PEI that does some coastal plants as well. Um, and it shouldn't be too hard to find lakefront plants. Um, I believe MTRI does a program on the Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute um, near Kajimpudik area. Um, they do a lot with coastal flora. Um, I don't know if they have a nursery, I don't think they do, but they um, would know where to find those in the wild. I'm looking at Jane across the room who's, who used to work there and she's nodding. So <laughs> there, uh, that's, that's first to find okay. out where that, that plant is to find. Um, and they're, yeah. they're very special plants too. Yeah, there certainly are some sources around for, for things. We've used a variety of, of nurseries, um, whether it's like Springfield trees out of Fredericton has been great, but he doesn't have a huge number of things. So you kind of got to be early on in the season. And Cornhill is good for sure. Um, there's also like McPhail Woods and there's a few different places around. Uh, they don't all deliver. So that's been our um, challenge sometimes is we find really a neat source for some interesting things that are hard to find but they won't deliver and we can't go and like put a whole bunch of things in our little cars. Um, so yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Janelle. Um, and we'll next go to Josh, his hand raised. Hi there, can you hear me all right? I was having audio trouble. A while ago, so I missed some of your, your presentation, Kelly. But um, thank you both. That was, that was was wonderful, both of you. From well, what I was able to hear because my headphones. Uh, but my question, and maybe you covered it, is on hybrid shorelines. So hardening and and soft. So we're currently looking at options for. Uh, burying riprap essentially the, the, as a big storm <laughs> safety net and then stand on top of that right. if you have any comments or maybe i missed it in your presentation yeah, burying um harder um, aspects of the shoreline are definitely um, applicable for a hybrid solution. um preferably not um any like concrete specific um, or like non-natural um, uh, stuff, essentially, um, that would be, it, it would be, it would still be effective, but um, concrete and various other materials do often leach um, things into the soil and are a little bit, um, while they're effective storm uh, buffers, they might add some pollutants or just other cumulative impacts to the system. So um, trying to use maybe like larger stones or or um, you can even bury logs or things like that um, just to create that revetment. And then um, planting on top of that is ideal as well because that also helps to uh, dissipate wave energy from the top side as well as providing that sort of wave buffer as well. 
that's my recommendation anyway. Um, professional could also definitely add some, um, a professional by the way um, means someone who actually implements these um, solutions on the ground um, rather than just talks about them like me. Um, but they're all, um, they all have different skill sets. So um, bringing sort of expectations to the table when it comes to new solutions is important, especially in the Maritimes, um, since uh, a lot of the practitioners around this area don't yet have a lot of um, background in nature-based and hybrid infrastructure. Although it's getting more so, which is great. Thank you for the question. Uh, are there any other questions for Kelly or Amanda or both of them? Um, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I just want to thank Amanda and Kelly both for their wonderful presentations. And I know Kelly mentioned that they're willing to, to answer any questions. I think you could reach out to either of the speakers after the presentation if more questions come up. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a part of a series of webinars, and we do have a couple more coming up. Uh, one on July 4th on living shorelines, which will go into more depth on the Mohone Bay uh, shoreline that Kelly briefly mentioned during their presentation, uh, as well as the, some living shorelines in PEI. And then we had just scheduled one on J July 20th, uh, looking at wetlands and naturalized stormwater retention ponds in, in Dieppe and Centerville, New Brunswick. So we really encourage you to, to join us for our later sessions. Um, and reach out to the speakers if you have any questions. Um, so thank you so much for coming and uh, for listening to these wonderful presentations. Um, and we hope to see you at future webinars as well. Thanks, everyone.